Thanks, Dave. Thanks for the opportunity. And we'd say welcome to each one uh, joining in on the webinar this evening. We value your time and would not seek to waste your time and uh, would pray that this meeting would be for uh, your blessing in understanding further the message of the gospel. So we're just going to read by begin by reading together uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Uh, these are words written by the Apostle Paul to the assembly in Corinth, and he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen. We have here before us in 1 Corinthians a beautiful, symmetrical, and clear statement of the message of the gospel. In his prayer, our brother Dave referred to this as good news. And what we would like to share with you this evening is this news of the Savior. It's news that happened, as Dave pointed out, not quite 2,000 years ago, um, but it is news that rem remains relevant and important. It's interesting if you follow the news every so often, there is a global news story that seems to catch everyone's attention all over the world. I think in the last week, a news story that has caught people's attention is the story of this uh, massive cargo ship, the Ever Given, that was trapped in the Suez Canal. But of course, that has been freed, and that story will fade into the distance. But the news that we have for you this evening is news that will never fade. It is the most important news to ever be shared in this world. And it is the most important news we could share with you. And so I would just like to think of these two great events that are communicated to us. The two great events are these, that Christ died is the first, and the second, that he rose again. We are given two great reasons in the scripture for these two great events. Christ died, what is the reason? For our sins. He rose again, what is the reason? If we turned to Romans chapter 4 at the end, we would read that he was delivered for our offenses, but he was raised again for our justification. He died for our sins. He rose again for our justification. This section also gives us two great evidences of the reality of these events. He died. What was the evidence? He was buried. He rose again. And what was the evidence? He was seen. And so I would just like to present this message to you this evening. What is the authority for all of this? In the verses we read together, it was re repeated twice, according to the scriptures. So I hope tonight, as we consider the gospel, that you would think about these great events, the two greatest events in all of human history, events that have evidence, events that had a reason, events that have an authority. And what do they mean to you tonight? I spent some time this week reading uh, stories online and some details about shipping in reading that story about the Ever Given. And I found a very interesting website. There is a website called Marine Tracker, and it has GPS on every major ship traveling around the globe. It's amazing. It makes sense with technology that they could have this, but you could pick a coast and zoom in on it and pick a specific ship. And if you click on the ship, you're given the name of the ship. Uh, you're given the last time that their position was received. Usually, usually, it's something like one minute ago, and you're told its destination. And it would be easy to think, well, a, a cargo ship like that, sure, it's large, but if it gets out there in the middle of the ocean, no one is aware of it. And yet there is information of its exact position, its exact destination. And, you know, sometimes people have that idea when they think about God. 
and when they think about eternity. They think, you know, I'm just one person here lost in the ocean of humanity. It, it can't be that God is aware of me, that God is aware of my position, that God is aware of my destination. But the message of the gospel tonight is that God is indeed aware of each one of us. And just like I was able to click on a ship and get those details, if in heaven someone clicked on your life, what would it say is your eternal destination? Where are you traveling to beyond this life? Where are you headed? Are you headed for judgment or are you headed for heaven? What is your destination? What is your position? The question from 1 Corinthians 15 here is have you received this message? To receive the message is to be affected by it. John wrote in his first chapter, and to as many as received him, the Lord Jesus, to them gave he the power to be called the sons of God, to as many as believed in his name. And so John connects the idea of receiving this message with believing in the one connected with this message. To receive the message of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven is a challenge to each one of us. Have I believed on him? Has he become my savior? And so I'd like to just review these wonderful facts with you again this evening of the gospel message. Good news for you because it is good news that could change your eternal destination. Here's the first great event. Christ died. If you think back over the last year, one of the things we also follow in the news is the news of different people who have passed away, who have died. Sometimes we receive news of people passing away who are very close to us, and it has a great effect on us because that relationship we enjoyed with them on this earth has ended. They've died. They've passed beyond this life. But there's also great interest in receiving news of the death of other people, of celebrities, of people who have done great things in their lives. Why does that interest us so much? Perhaps it's the thought of their great works coming to an end. Perhaps it's the thought of someone who I thought was so wonderful being vulnerable to death, just like me. You likely remember a year ago hearing the news, Kobe Bryant, a, an excellent basketball player had passed away at such a, a young age. Why is that such a shock to us? We know in our hearts that death is linked with humanity, that before each one of us is a death that we cannot escape. The Bible gives us an explanation for this. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it says, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. If we know the truth that all men die, why do we take such, such interest in the news that different people that we really don't know have died? But when we come to 1 Corinthians tonight and to this great message that Christ died, this is news. Well, it is inevitable that every other man should die, that Christ should die was not an inevitability. It is an amazing news story that Christ died. He died on a cross. It had been promised in the Old Testament prophecies. The way that the Jews would execute someone was to stone them. And there were many times in his ministry that they took up stones and they were prepared to kill him with stones. But in the end, in fulfillment of the word of God, he died on a cross. But in some ways, thousands of Jewish men at that time had died upon a cross. His death was a voluntary death. He gave himself, he surrendered himself to death. Through history, there have been many stories of men who have voluntarily, and women who have voluntarily, surrendered their lives, whether they dove upon a grenade or whatever the story may be. There are people who have given their lives 
to save others. But the death of Christ was like no other death. It was voluntary. It was on a cross. But he was the one upon whom death had no claim. Death is linked with sin. And he is the man without sin. He could not die. He had to surrender himself over to death. And if you read the details of the cross carefully, you will see the reality of this. That as he came to the end of his time on the cross, after he had cried, it is is finished. He had to surrender himself to death. The Bible says so simply uh, that he committed himself unto his father and he bowed his head and gave up the do- the de- uh, gave up the spirit gave up the ghost christ indeed died a voluntary death he gave himself over to death but it was a unique death a death unlike any other and so it should cause you and i to ask the great question what was the reason for this death his death was not an accident he died because the Jewish leaders at that time hated him. He died because Pilate and and the Romans were willing to execute uh, an innocent man. He died because he was nailed upon the cross, but he died because he gave himself over to death. And in 1 Corinthians, we are given the reason so clearly for his death. Christ died for our sins. Not for his own. Every other man dies because of sin and because of his own sins. And Christ died for sin, even though he had no sin. If you read about that ship, the Ever Given, this week, I'm sure you were impressed at the sheer size of that ship. A ship more than a quarter of a mile long and a ship that could, that was made to hold those giant containers. Perhaps you would see one of them traveling down the road on a tractor trailer, but this ship is so massive that it can hold over 20,000 of those containers. Imagine if you could have gone over to Egypt and stood on the, the shores of that canal and looked up at that massive ship and its massive load. How enormous it would seem, how impossible it would seem that that load could be lifted and that the ship could be freed. The way could be opened up. Imagine what it would be like if you or I could truly get a look at our own sin and at the sin of a world. How many sins have I committed in the last year of my life? And if I added them up over my lifetime, sins that I have committed willfully, sins that I have Uh, committed and not even noticed throughout my life, if I added them up, pile upon pile, and the sins of everyone related to me and the sins of everyone in my town and in my state, imagine the immense pile of sin there would be, a load that could not be removed. We cannot even begin to pay for one sin. How could such a load be taken out of the way. It is sin that comes between us and God. How can that be removed that we can enjoy a right relationship with God? This is the good news of the gospel this evening. Christ died for our sins. We could not even begin to pay for one sin. And yet in those hours upon the cross, he entered into an infinite suffering that he may pay for sins. How about your sin? Have you received the Lord Jesus as your savior, as the answer for your sins? What was the evidence that his death was real? That he really died? Because there are enemies of Christ and of the gospel who in the centuries since have sought to say, well, he didn't really die. He just swooned upon the cross. And when he got into the coldness, of the tomb he woke up but that is not what the evidence says the soldiers men accustomed to death were sure that he had died you remember the soldier who came to break the legs of the men upon the cross when he came to the lord jesus he saw that he had already died and he thrust 
the spear into his side because the soldier was convinced he was di- he had died and pilate needed to be convinced that the lord had already died he called the centurion to be given testimony yes he has died the jews were convinced that he had died they went home to keep their feast satisfied that their enemy had been defeated joseph of arimathea And Nicodemus and the women were convinced that he had died because they took down his body and they buried him. And so this great event occurred. Christ died for this great reason, our sins. And there is this great evidence. He was buried and he went into the tomb. And there was that night of darkness and of silence. But on the third day, we have this second great event that is so closely linked with his death. The second great event, he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. This resurrection displays the wonderful truth that God is just. Christ was an innocent man. He had no sin to deserve death and death could not hold him. There had been others who had come back from the dead. There are four resurrections in the gospel accounts. There is the young 12-year-old girl, the daughter of Jairus, who had just died, and the Lord Jesus came into the house and called her back. There was the son of the widow of Nain headed out to the grave, who the Lord Jesus stopped the funeral procession and called him back to life. And there was Lazarus, who had been dead for four days and was in within the tomb. And the Lord Jesus called him forth, Lazarus, come forth. But the resurrection of the Lord Jesus was completely different. Lazarus had no ability to come back from the dead, nor did the boy or the girl. But the Lord Jesus had the power and the right to return from the dead. The Lord Jesus was raised by the power of the Father. The Lord Jesus was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he rose again the third day. The stone was moved away from the tomb. The angels didn't come to remove the stone so that the Lord Jesus could escape from out of the tomb. The stone was removed so that the disciples could see that within the tomb, the Lord Jesus had been resurrected. What is the great reason? for the resurrection. We can all agree that it is right, it is just that the Lord Jesus should rise from the dead because there was nothing in him deserving of death. But what is the reason for his resurrection? The resurrection is a proclamation. And as we pointed to in uh, Romans chapter four, he was delivered for our offenses, but was raised again for our justification. What does it mean to be justified? Imagine if you were the captain in charge of this boat, the Ever Given. I think he's going to have to appear uh, before some different bodies in his company and in the maritime organizations and give an explanation for why that ship ran aground. Now, I know there's explanations. There was a, a giant windstorm there in the desert that threw the ship off of course but i would think that that captain is nervous and it feels anxious about answering for for this great problem and imagine how he will feel if on that day when he stands before his superiors they say we've reviewed the data and we find no evidence that you have done anything wrong we we find you justified in our eyes it's the reason for the resurrection. The resurrection tells us what God thinks about the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us that God is pleased with the Lord Jesus, that God is satisfied with his death. But the resurrection also proclaims something about us. The resurrection proclaims our justification. And if you think of that example of the ship captain, what it means for you and I is that in the throne room of God, we can be proclaimed just, that there are no charges to be brought up 
against us. And you might say, well, how can that be? You just spoke earlier about the mountain of our sins. How could we ever be proclaimed just? Because of this first great event and first great reason, Christ died for our sins. If that is true, the second event must be true. If Christ died, he must rise again. If Christ died for our sins, he must rise again for our justification. If you had to stand before God today, what would the answer be for your sins? And if any other answer comes into your mind than the Lord Jesus Christ, please go back to the Bible and search out your salvation because salvation is in Christ. Justification, a right standing before God, is only found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If his burial was evidence, of his death. What is the evidence of his resurrection? Paul states it here so clearly. He says so clearly, and that he was seen. And we are given a whole list of different believers who saw the Lord Jesus after his resurrection. He appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other women. He appeared to those two on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to the disciples in the upper room. And then he appeared a week later when Thomas was with them. He appeared in Galilee. He appeared to more than 500. He appeared to James. Paul saw him in a vision on the road uh, to Emmaus. And those appearances were proof of the resurrection that changed the lives of these people. You think of a Thomas whose faith was crushed, that he could not even receive the news of the resurrection until he saw the evidence of the marks of Calvary. But how the evidence, the proof of that resurrection melted his heart as he said, my Lord and my God. You think of Peter, a man who in his own strength had run into such failure, who had denied the Lord Jesus so vigorously. And yet when he met with the Lord Jesus, he was restored. He was transformed into a man who was a pillar of the early church. You think of Paul, such an enemy of the gospel and of Christ, but when he saw the risen Christ seated in heaven, everything was changed because this was true. Christ died for our sins. He rose again the third day for our justification, and he was seen. We have a couple uh, visiting our assembly uh, in Pensauken, and they are, in my opinion, seriously considering the message of the gospel. And we've been doing a study uh, through the book of John. And just the other week, uh, the wife asked this very deep question at the end of our study. She said, how can we know that we are saved? How does a person know that they have been saved? And one of the brethren there gave an excellent answer. I'll give them to you in reverse. He said, there are really three evidences of the reality of salvation in the life of a person. The third evidence is the change that salvation brings in a life. The Bible describes salvation as being a new creation. And when a person is saved, they are changed. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that every bad habit is gone forever, but there is an evident change from the effects of salvation. The second, more important evidence is that a person who has been saved receives the Holy Spirit. And it is not a matter that the longer we live our Christian life, we receive more of the Holy Spirit. On the first day a person is saved, they have as much of the Holy Spirit as a person who has been saved for 50 years. And the Holy Spirit works within a person, renewing their conscience, convicting them of things that are wrong. There have been many stories of people who have been saved uh, just a few days, and they have come to someone and said, I, I think maybe I'm not truly saved. And the person say, why is that? Well, you know, I've been a smoker for my whole life, and I smoked a cigarette, and I feel so guilty about that. And I think it's evidence that I'm not saved. And just to the contrary, the Christian has pointed out 
smoking a cigarette never bothered you before, but now the Holy Spirit is convicting you. And so the Holy Spirit in, is evidence in our lives of salvation. But the first evidence, there is the change. There is the work of the Holy Spirit. But there are the scriptures. And you'll notice in the verses we read tonight, this evidence, this authority is repeated twice over. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the authority. When we bring this news of salvation to you, it is the message that we are seeking to preach today. It is the message that the believers in Midland Park seek to fair faithfully share. It is the message that the Apostle Paul preached throughout the ancient world, but it is the message that we have received that has been delivered to us that we wish for you to receive. Have you received this message? Have you considered the authority of this message? Search the scriptures. If you have questions, if you think this message does not line up with with what we have in the scriptures, please speak to one of us and make that known because we are seeking to share with you a message that is on the authority of the scriptures. I read one other interesting story uh, in the news this week. There was a couple in South Korea and they went to an art exhibit. And at this exhibit, there was a display of some graffiti art. And part of this display, down in front of it, there were cans of paint and brushes. And the apparently, I don't know if you or I would be willing to spend this on this piece of art, but apparently it was valued at $500,000. And this couple was confused. They thought that this was a piece of uh, participatory art. So they reached down over the edge, grabbed some of those brushes, dipped it in some black paint, and added a few strokes to the painting. Later on, the people at the art exhibit realized what had happened and they reviewed the security cameras and they realized this couple had tried to add to this very expensive piece of artwork. When we think about the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are thinking about a work that is finished. And there are so many people in our world that are happy to receive the news of a savior, happy to consider his death, joyful to consider his resurrection. And yet their attitude is, I need to add something to this. Just a few small strokes on my behalf to, to add to this masterpiece. God through his son has finished the work. He is asking for nothing more from you than to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. If you are not saved this evening, I would ask you to just examine yourself and see if perhaps you have been trying to add to the work of salvation because that will keep you from receiving the savior. There's nothing you can add to this work. The Lord Jesus cried, it is finished. And he was giving us his authority, his proclamation that the work for salvation was paid. And the Father has given us his demonstration that the work is finished when he raised the Son from the dead. So let me just close by giving you this great good news one more time. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen. There is salvation that will change your eternal destination in this great truth. And I hope that if you are not yet saved, that at some point in the coming week, your destination would be updated, your position would be changed, and your position would be in Christ with an eternal destination in heaven. Thank you for your attention to the gospel this evening, and we will just close with a message of prayer.